Hey, thanks for inviting me to come speak to you guys tonight about Living Lands and Waters. Uh, we're a nonprofit that was started uh, over 20 years ago by my friend and boss, Chad Pergracki, uh, out of the Quad Cities. Um, but we're, we're, we believe we're the only like industrial strength river cleanup organization um, in the world, at least at the scale that we operate. And I, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the history, the mission, and, and just the, some other things related to some of the consequences of all this, this trash that's ended up in our rivers and other work that we do. And please feel free to ask questions throughout the present presentation at any time. Um, I won't be able to see the chat, so if you can unmute yourself to ask, that'd be great. I don't mind. Um, if so any chat me messages to... come in, I will go ahead and uh, mention it to you. Awesome. All right, can everybody see that logo on the screen, Living Lands and Waters? Is that, you see that, Dennis? Yes, everything looks fine. All right, awesome. So, like I said, the organization was started by my my friend and boss, Chad Prokratchy, who grew up um, just outside of East Moline, Illinois, in Hampton, Illinois, uh, right out. His, his parents' uh, house was literally 15 feet from the river, so he spent a lot of time on the river, uh, playing, fishing, water skiing on the river. And he also worked as a commercial shell diver, diving for mussel shells in high school in the summers and in, in, in high school and in college with his older brother, uh, who still works as a commercial fisherman on the Mississippi River. And this is him in his gear um, back in the day with the wetsuit, the, the respirator, the, the, the hose, the, the pump oxygen down there with his net as he collected shells and crawled the bottom of the, uh, the Mississippi River. And he did a lot of work too as well, diving for mussels on the Illinois River too. But it was all this time that he spent on the river, camping on islands, doing this work, and just growing up on the river that he, you know, recognized this problem of all this trash. And originally, um, you know, first approached officials of the state government asking for funding uh, to aggressively tackle this problem of all this trash that accumulated in, in the rivers. And they all turned them down for a variety of different reasons. You know, some were just reluctant to have such a huge task taken on by such a young young kid at the time in high school, um, you know, just others just doubted, you know, he, just his ability to do it or the lack of funding just for that particular project. So Chad could have given up here, but he had this, um, you know, he's not one to give up very easily. And obviously this is something he's very connected, very passionate about. And he's just a very per persistent personality to begin with. So in college, his buddies had a NASCAR race on TV and they know he noticed while watching the race that, you know, the NASCAR is decorated by different logos or companies. And he thought if companies would be willing to sponsor someone to drive a NASCAR, maybe companies would be willing to sponsor someone to um, fund a river cleanup effort. So he took the idea, ran with it and talked to different, a lot of different companies, reached out to a lot of different businesses. And um, most of them, um, he, he found no luck, but uh, eventually got one sponsor for $8,400. And it was enough just for him to go out in his own boat. Uh, so in the beginning, it was just him in his own John boat like this, collecting trash from the, the shorelines, the islands, and shallower waters. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was tough work. And, and one of the dilemmas he found is what, you know, just the, the process of once you collect it, you know, the time it takes to properly dispose of it, take it to a recycling center or to a landfill, that took a lot of time. Um, and only having enough funding really to support himself or fuel in his own boat, disposal fees, um, and any damages that might occur to his equipment. Um, but he, he got a break, you know, people saw what he was doing and, and some of these people contacted the local newspaper, the Quad City Times came out, did a story on Chad that ran on the front page of the paper, got him some positive exposure, also got positive exposure for the company that sponsored him. And, through that article, also through the Associated Press, major news networks got one of this story and started covering Chad's efforts of this young young kid cleaning up the Mississippi River. And that helped uh, legitimize his efforts. Like I said, brought him more positive exposure on a national level. And it became a little bit easier for him to gain and collect funding from that point. Um, but still, you know, it was still hard, you know, but he, he knew he wanted to get more equipment. He wanted to hire more people to work with him. And he knew that was going to take funding. But literally in the beginning, um, he was even staging trash in his parents' backyard until he could properly dispose of it. Now, obviously, they weren't 
too uh, happy about that. But, uh, you know, just the process of trying to get rid of them on a daily day to day basis. And I'm going to show you how things have grown and changed in his solution to this problem. Um, but I want to kind of go over just uh, what we did this year. Uh, we did do a lot of work in Peoria on the Illinois River this year. Uh, it was just the crew. Uh, for the most part, we did do uh, a smaller cleanup with CAT, or, you know, using precaution, uh, CAT employees. Um, but this year we've done 130 cleanups. Only 16 of those were, were with volunteers. So the rest of that was just with the crew and we removed uh, 172,000 pounds of trash from rivers that we worked this year. Now, um, that's really not, <laughs> we're used to working with a lot more volunteers. Um, and, and because of that, our numbers are, are down. On average, we probably remove about, well, I know we do because I keep our stats. We remove over 500,000 pounds of trash from rivers on average every year at least. Um, but our overall stats, we've worked since Chad first started. We've now worked in 21 different states on 24 different rivers with a lot of help from volunteers, over 117,000 volunteers, and removed nearly 10.9 million pounds of trash from when Chad first started. And go through here. But, you know, the problem that we face before I show you that, you know, I like to talk, what we do is reactive, but it really... Um, you know, there's a bigger problem in, in, that I like to talk about when I do these presentations, and it's just the, the simple fact that we, uh, as a country and just as a society, definitely produce way too much trash. Um, we make about 5% of the world's population, but we're responsible about 30% of its garbage. We make enough garbage every day to fill up a Major League Baseball stadium from top to bottom, from just our everyday's um, uh, you know, just what we make in garbage every day. And then I like to also, and this may be, I'll go through this quickly, um, and you guys might be aware of this, but I think a lot of people think, you know, and people do directly dump stuff into the river, but a lot of it is just mismanagement of trash and just litter in our streets that over time through rain and storm drains or overflowing trash cans, over time that stuff ends up washing into our rivers. In fact, 80% of the stuff that we collect it starts out as just litter in neighborhoods. And um, it, it is stuff that obviously gets dumped directly in the river or from flooding, but a lot of it is just stuff that starts out on land and through heavy rains and wind blows into our rivers from people illegal dump, dumping stuff from floods, obviously can wash big, big things, entire homes. We've worked in areas after major floods and actually cleaned up housing debris after floods, uh, both in Cedar Rapids and in Wisconsin, uh, the Wisconsin River. Uh, the sea, so after big floods there, storm drains obviously making that connection. I'll go through this quickly. This might be common knowledge to you guys, but I just think it's important to stress that most of the stuff that we collect really comes from the land. And even when you do properly dispose of stuff, um, like even plastic bags, this is a, a photo from a landfill. You know, that stuff can't stay contained and sometimes can even blow out of there, out of that landfill. Those are both photos from landfills. And just understanding, you know, uh, how the river connects us all and, and, and understanding, you know, just how big the Mississippi River's watershed and what's done to the land can have an effect on our water quality. The Mississippi River where 18 million people get their daily drinking water and um, just, just how big that watershed the Mississippi River is. You know, it's made up of over 31 U.S. states, parts of two Canadian provinces. It's basically that watershed is between you know, the Rockies and the Appalachians, like a bathtub effect and all these other tributaries, including the Illinois, which comes in at Grafton, Illinois, flow into and affect the water quality of the Mississippi River and eventually out into our, our oceans. This is the, a fact I like to throw out there too. A big, big thing that a lot of people um, don't understand is the, the fact, and this is just maybe a message to spread to others too, is just that cigarette butts, you know, one cigarette butt can pollute up to two gallons of water, and when you throw it on the street, that can negatively impact our waterways. But I want to get into areas that we worked and the magnitude of the problem in the different locations that we worked. This is actually, these photos I'm going to show you are all sites that we have worked. And this photo right here is um, a backwater of the Mississippi River in Memphis, Tennessee. And this is all floating garbage here. And you can see all the plastic, the styrofoam. But that's, that's another thing I like to address is just our overuse of single use plastics and items that we use for a short period of time and they don't get properly disposed of but, or recycled. 
But the reality is plastic is different than, um, let's say like an aluminum can that can consistently come back as an aluminum can. Plastic gets down cycled until it becomes such a low grade plastic that eventually it's landfilled. In fact, only 9% of plastics, when you think of all the plastics with packaging and toys and all the, all the, all the, all the forms of plastic come in, um, only 9% of it is actually recycled. And in worst case scenarios is ending up in our waterways. And because of that, you know, these are some of the consequences. According to the United States Geological Survey, on average, 1,285 particles of microplastic can be found in each square foot of, foot of U.S. river sediments. And, and here's the magnitude of the problem. It's not only coming from, I mean, it's everywhere. Not only this trash, but even tires. I mean, our tires are made of synthetic, synthetic rubber or plastic, and it's wearing off our tires. Our clothing, um, you know, made from synthetics. When you wash your clothes, parts of that shedding off. And over time, those plastics I show you, they, they, they break down into smaller pieces and get into our waterways. And because of this, it's ending up in the fish uh, in our rivers. You know, 12% of the fish in our rivers, um, based on a study, contain some types of microplastic. And it's even worse and magnif uh, you know, increased when you get into the ocean. One in four fish or 25% of fish in oceans, they've, they're discovering plastics in their stomach. Once it gets out from our rivers, you know, and, and here's the connection, you know, 90% of the trash that's in our oceans is getting a lot of attention with all this plastic debris and waste. 90% of that is originating from inland riverways like the Mississippi River. Um, and, and we talk about that, you know, that watershed of the Mississippi River, how big it is and how it connects so many people. And like that landmass, that litter over time can work its way through these other tributaries in the Mississippi River, ultimately into the Gulf. But it's estimated because of this plastic debris, over a million seabirds die every year, like this albatross. And it's, this is its decomposed body. And you can Google this on the internet, and you, you guys might be aware of this, but um, they're confusing this stuff as food. Um, all these plastics that are getting out into our oceans. And they estimate there's now over 5 trillion pieces of plastic that are now in our oceans. Um, and here's a crazy stat for you, a garbage truck per minute where the plastic is entering our ocean. Every minute there's a garbage truck worth of plastics entering our oceans and it doesn't go away. It breaks down in these tiny, tiny pieces over time through wave action and sunlight. And this is actually a sample taken from thousands of miles out in the Pacific Ocean. And you can see where easily maybe or accidentally uh, marine life or birds might confuse this as food or accidentally consume this stuff. This is contents found in the sea turtle stomach that ultimately led to its death. And they estimate that 100,000 marine animals die each year due to plastic debris as well, including marine animals as big as this whale. With, after doing an autopsy, they discovered the cause of this whale's death was a bunch of plastic within its stomach. And just to give you, it just gets within the food web all the way down to the bottom of that food chain. Um, and, and it obviously bioaccumulates or becomes greater as you go up that food thing because everything in that food web in our in our ecosystems is getting plastic in it. I mean, all of us, if we were to you know break down, there is there are microplastics in all in all of us. Um, a macroinvertebrate creature. I don't know exactly which one that is in the ocean. And those neon green specks actually uh, represent, they represent microplastics that that zooplankton has um, eaten. So, and confused this food. So it's not only, you know, and then these other things in the food web, in the food web higher up are eating it accidentally, but also the things that they eat has, has plastic in it. And like I said, they've done studies in both fish markets in Indonesia and California. And from fish caught in the ocean, they found that one in four had plastics within them. And, and, and here's the magnitude of the problem. This Charles Moore, who's done a lot of studies on the North Pacific gyre where currents converge. In 1999, he found six times more plastic particles than zooplankton. That, what's life at the bottom of that food web, you know, just before above phytoplankton, six times more weight in plastics than zooplankton. And that was in 1999. By 2014, it had multiplied to a hundred times more plastics than plankton. So this problem is, you know, 
exponentially getting worse. And the, 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 the thing to be proactive is we really need to evaluate lessening our, our use of plastics and understanding that this stuff, even if you properly throw it away, it's going to be in a landfill. Every plastic ever made still exists today. Styrofoam cups, another form of plastic, but just the magnitude of the numbers to give you an idea of that. And um, bottled water, another one, one of the biggest scams ever, you know, you know, if people were to tell, if somebody was to tell you, you can pay, somebody's going to be paying $2 for a bottle of water um, 30 years ago, you say, you're crazy. And, and it's not any cleaner than the water that comes from your tap most of the time. In fact, the standards for bottled water regulated by the FDA are not as strict as the standards the EPA sets for your tap water. A large majority of this bottled water is tap water, putting a bottle sold to you for a lot more money. People that just strict, strictly drink bottled water consume 90,000 more microplastics a year opposed to people that drink tap water. So these are some of the negatives. And then obviously you have this plastic waste. So you're spending a lot more money for a product that's really not any better. We've been, you know, we've been hustled to think, wow, this is really crystal clear, pure water. So using, But here are some more stats for you. And I think this is important to you when you think about um, the bigger picture here and, and the magnitude of this industry. Um, but Americans in 2018 spent $31 billion on bottled water. And they estimate for $24 billion a year, we could fix the problems like you have, you saw in Flint, Michigan with their, with their tap water system. But for $24 billion a year, they estimate um, if we pump that into our, our public infrastructure, our public water system, we could fix that and have a perfect system for, for, for the problem where there are problems with our infrastructure uh, when it comes to our tap water that we get. In fact, the American Society of Civil Engineering has awarded the drinking water insurance of the United States a grade of D minus or D for over a decade. Here's the cost, bottled water cost between 250 to 10,000 times as much per gallon as tap water. This is what I was talking about earlier, that 90,000 microplastics for people that just strictly drink bottled water. I'll go through this quickly. But plastics, once again, even down to the, you know, just our use of straws that we don't think about. Um, 500 million straws used every day in the United States. And that's just a small plastic item, you know, big deal, whatever. But if you laid those straws from end to end, that would circle the globe two and a half times. You know, plastic bags, if we can get away from, you know, just reusing reusable bags, not, you know, when you get one item, don't, don't get a bag, you know, these are simple things, but the, you know, this stuff all adds up and it's just become such a part of our culture that we don't even think about it. Even our coffee, these K-cups, um, there's enough of these sold every year to circle the globe 10 and a half times, these plastic K-cups. So how stuff is packaged, thinking about, you know, I've switched, you know, just making switches, but this is the reality. This is the, what we're seeing. These are for the, the plastic and the stuff that doesn't get into our landfill. This is where it's ending up. And like I said, these are all photos that we have taken from locations where these aren't doctored photos taken from there. These are all locations that we have worked. But I want to leave you with some hope because this is a shot taken from Memphis, Tennessee. This is a the city nine years ago working, getting stuff off the levee, but you can see all the stuff floating in the background. But we have a great program. It's an alternative spring break program where we trick college students. No, we just joke. Instead of going to Florida, come pick garbage up with us. No, it's a great program. But college students over the last nine years from all over the country have come to Memphis. We've had local high school students and local volunteers in the Memphis community and our crew just, you know, keep working, keep plugging on this problem and cleaning this lake up. You know, it can seem almost paralyzing and so big, the problem's so big. But this is what this this area and section looks like now just from our work. And that's a lot of hard work and a lot of maintenance, you know, keeping back and, and keeping it clean and also putting in, we're at the source, um, buoys to collect it or booms, I should say a boom. But that's not, you know, other places, just the idea of shorelines on the Delaware River in Philadelphia, more shots of locations we worked. But we, we, on a typical year, we like to work with volunteers or sponsors. We go out, we collect the stuff. This is actually from Peoria. Um, we fill these boats. And, and this year in Peoria alone, I think we removed over 15,000 pounds worth of stuff. But we fill our boats. We have six of these John boats, five of them 30 feet long. They can 
hold lots of stuff. Um, we fill these boats with the trash we collect. We have heavy equipment that allows us to get bigger things like cranes. We even pull the combine out. This is from the Ohio River. Um, and now we've got an excavator that John Deere is donating to us to allow us to get bigger things from cars to, to sunken boats. Things that we couldn't get before are really heavy items that we couldn't get by hand before. Allows us to transport stuff around on our barges. We try to recycle as much stuff as possible. We have events where we sort through the bag garbage with volunteers. We put out long um, tables to minimize the stuff that goes to a landfill. Um, we also, all the, all the tires, all the scrap metal, and even this bag plastic and separate as much of this stuff as we can get to in a year and sort through to, to get properly disposed of and at least repurposed. But once again, this is, this is the magnitude, this is the, the mound of plastic that will, you know, we collect. But here's our rig from the outside. We've got five barges, two towboats, uh, an excavator. Um, this is also the, the one with the roof is our uh, living quarters. We live on there about seven months out of the year. Um, it also serves as a floating classroom where we have students come in and do hands-on river education. Um, you'll notice uh, the, out, the top of that, we have solar panels that um, when we're parked, a lot of our power needs just run off those solar panels to cut down on our carbon emissions. Just more shots of our bus. That's an up close uh, photo of our towboat, all done by spray paint by graffiti muralist out of St. Louis. Gives you that unique touch. Another shot of our barge here. That's the inside of uh, our living room slash floating classroom where we'll bring students out to do hands-on educational workshops. Just some of the toys on a shelf in that classroom that we've collected over the years. We all have our own room. This is just my room on the barge. So um, we got our own space, pretty nice. And what we do is, like I said, we're not doing cleanups. Another thing we do is, is educational, being proactive, educating kids about why rivers are important, what the problem is, and bringing students out to do hands-on um, river education stuff. And also just connecting groups like uh, this is, uh, you know, bringing out groups like the Boys and Girls Club and just getting them out on the rivers, help, you know, connecting them with them, um, helping them gain an appreciation for um, these awesome places. Canoe trip with the Boys and Girls Club. And then we also have our Millions Trees Project. We plan and distribute about 1.5 million trees since this program has started. This is our nursery that we maintain. So we have a lot going on. We, we really, we've only have 10 full-time crew members. So we do, a, there's a lot we're doing and we really heavily dep depend on volunteers to, 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 to make us successful. And then here's the fun part, you know, when we go out, you never know what you're gonna find to make it fun. Well, we don't have volunteers, we compete to see and get the coolest stuff, the most stuff, just to share with you guys some of the unique finds over the years. There's a porta potty on the left, the hot tub. I think we've removed over 16 hot tubs since the organization first started. Bikes, power wheel, canoes, messages in bottles are always really cool. The guy on the left has a message in a bottle. The guy on the right, a prosthetic leg. I think there's been 13 of those different prosthetic legs found in rivers over the years. This guitar, like a guitar found in Memphis, Tennessee, pretty cool find. Helmets, football pads, even home plate. I mean, radar gun. A lot of unique toys. Um, this is probably one of the crazier. This we actually found this with the rat zip tied onto the toy horse. Um, kind of a it's a fun one. Bowling balls. Bowling balls actually float. Some of them. Fun fact: if they're 12 pounds or lighter, it has to do with their density. They don't all float, but some bowling balls float. At least the ones we find. Toilet seat, clown shoe. Kind of looks like Ronald McDonald's shoe. I don't know what happened to the rest of Ronald that day, but I think it's pretty safe to say he probably wasn't loving it that day on the river. And there is a crazy one. And you got, I'm going to, anybody want to guess what this is? This was found by a volunteer in Paducah, Kentucky. Anybody want to guess what this is? Any guesses? 
It looks like some kind of a weight for uh, maybe diving or something. It's not a weight. Any other guesses? Anybody feel free to unmute themselves and take a guess. All right. Well, that was a that was a that's a Civil War mortar shell. It's a mortar shell from the Civil War found by a volunteer, and he initially left it. He thought it was that's what he thought it was because he googled it. He, he could tell it was something really unique. And this was found on the banks of the Ohio River in Paducah. And initially left it with us. We posted on our Facebook page. People were like, hey, you need to get that checked out. That could be live. That could go off. And uh, at that point, the guy had come back and he had gotten this. He said, hey, can I have that back? It's really cool. I go, yeah, for sure. You can have it. And then people were like, hey, you need to get it checked out. So I had to reach back out to this guy. And he's like, I'm out of town. I'll be back in town a week. I'll make sure it gets checked out. So. The funny part of the story is I get a text on a Tuesday and I remember it was a Tuesday because he was like, yeah, I, I called the authorities. They, they had, it was what I thought it was. They brought their, their expert, their bomb squad to my apartment. They evacuated my entire apartment complex. They said it was still alive, had black powder. And it said if it went off, it could have blown up half the building. And then he, at the end of the text, it said, how was your Monday? Um, but anyway, so that's one of the crazier finds. You know, just to protect, you know, the river is a beautiful uh, questions. Mike, we did have one question yeah. that came in. And the question is, how far in from the water do you collect? How far in from the water? Like, uh, how far from the water do you on the shorelines? Yes, I assume that's what it means. It just depends where we're at. I mean, sometimes you'll get stuff gets flooded back really, really far. Um, one of the cool things about when the water's high, like in Peoria this year, we worked when it was flooded and you can you can drive back in the woods and get to these spots that otherwise you have to walk, you know, hundreds and hundreds of yards, which we which we do with volunteers in the, in the crew sometimes. So just where the water goes and deposits stuff, we'll go in that far, sometimes up to, like I said, I mean, sometimes even a half a mile, we just have to relay stuff out with volunteers. Any other questions? But no, these are just, no. oh, go ahead. Another question? No, go ahead. Oh, these are just, a, you know, the river is a beautiful place. And just to keep that, just appreciate it for, for what it is and just the different locations we work in. Um, I'll stop it. If, if you'd like to follow us, we're at livinglandsandwaters.org or get involved. Um, we're on Facebook and Instagram at Living Lands and Waters. But I'll, I'll leave this time to, to open up for questions all. I'll go to just sharing my screen, I think, here. No, another question that came in is, do you have to get special permissions for the shorelines that you collect along? Um, in some cases, but honestly, it's like we'll go and be cleaned up below someone's house, and they kind of, they'll be maybe suspicious, and but most of the time they realize what we're doing, and they're pretty, they're pretty like, okay, hey, cool, that's cool. I mean, they see a boatload of trash. And they, they understand what we're doing. And they're usually pretty thankful and grateful. Just sometimes you get in areas where it's restricted, like near a refinery or um, like I know cleaning up before, like near Arsenal Island, you know, restricted areas where you got to, you got to, they're a little bit more weary about people coming on and, and cleaning up in those spots. Another question that came in is how do you move your big rig long distances? For example, the Delaware River to the Mississippi River? That's an excellent question. So in some cases, we'll move all our, our whole rig to locations uh, like the Ohio, the Tennessee, the Illinois, the Mississippi. Those, you know, those waterways are all connected. When it comes to like, um, let's say the East River, the Delaware River out east, sometimes we just bring our boats and then we work with local, um, you know, facilities as far as is disposing of stuff, recycling facilities and waste facilities and, and with dumpsters and stuff. Sometimes we just bring our John boats. We don't bring our whole rig. Anybody so I have, have a question. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so back on the drinking water uh, slide, I don't remember exactly what it said, but that's why a lot of people drink bottled water. They think it's you know, uh, better quality than their drinking water. Is that what your slide said or did it say something different? 
No, the reality is it's not. Right. In fact, the standards, I mean, the infrastructure of our, our, our tap water, obviously it, it can be improved, but even then the test, the standards for tap water are higher. They have to meet higher standards than even bottle. And, and bottle water, really, they just, it's not really, they, they do their own reporting, the companies, and they submit it to the FDA. And, and there's been consumer reports has done studies to, to show that a lot of time there's been cases where that bottle water is even, even dirtier than you think. And a lot of it, like 60% of it simply, they refilter tap water and sell it to you for a lot more money. So, and, and then the other problem is that the microplastics that you're consuming, if you just strictly drink bottled water, you're consuming about 90,000 more microplastics than you would if you just drink tap water because that stuff breaks down and, you know, yeah. gets into that, that water, those bottled water. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, it's just uh, unfortunate that things like uh, what happened in Flint, Michigan, uh, take all the headlines uh, versus, you know, the fact that drinking water is is really very safe um you know that's that's what should be getting the, he the headlines so that we did so that people don't drink all the bottled water yeah or, or and just the fact that if you looked at the stat 31 billion dollars if we took that money and did fix where there are problems in the infrastructure of our tap water you know taking just money and i think everybody to have a clean easily accessible drinking water I mean, for me, at least, I, I don't mind my tax tax dollars going to stuff like that. <laughs> that just makes sense. Yeah, one other, one other comment, um, sort of related is having to do with litter. And you mentioned, you know, just general litter in the streets and everywhere makes its way into the rivers. That's it's it's, uh, it's very true, I think. And uh, something I see a lot of, and I don't know if there are people on this call that have pickup trucks, but uh, there's a lot of garbage that flies out of people's pickup trucks. They, you know, they might throw a cup or can or something in the back of the pickup truck. Yeah. They, they just think it's going to stay there, but it rarely does. It seems like I, I'm driving along and I always seem to see stuff flying out of people's, you know, the, the back of their yeah uh, they don't know it they don't realize it and yeah uh, maybe they forget they even did it and it's gone from the, the bed of the yeah day. no just a lot yeah just the accidental litter too not to mention that yeah anybody else any questions comments I did notice in your one of your slides that you had on maybe it was Facebook or somewhere you had a lot of the big pieces of styrofoam that you know the larger pieces of styrofoam are those usually from the gravel pits I live in Spring Bay and I pick up bits of that styrofoam that were is that something you see a lot of we do and what it is and we got a lot of big chunks of styrofoam from uh Peoria Lake and Peoria you know Peoria Illinois this year what it yeah. is is it's it's from flooding and docks they put right. it under, they, and um, oh. it, it's used to float and protect, you know, underneath docks. And, and, and now a lot of times, even when it, I think there's a law that it has to be encased, but you have older docks or yeah. it gets broken out of that encasing over time. But right. yeah, those big chunks of styrofoam, that's usually used for, for, for dock, for fl floating docks, you know, underneath docks that make up a float. Yeah, I, I, I try to pick up the, I see the little pieces of it all the time. And I know it started out as those big floats. And then, and I say, we know we've got the tiny little bit, bits of styrofoam. And I, yeah. I think, I'm sure it's easier to pick it up as a big chunk, but you know, then it breaks yeah. down, as you mentioned, with yeah. the microplastics, I suppose it, you know, becomes a, a problem. Yeah, it, it, it's really, if people can come to some of the locations we work in, and see the magnitude of they would they would really think about ever purchasing anything in styrofoam again right i mean literally there'll be plastic in some places really bad like memphis or delaware there'll be plastic bottles but underneath it it's like a mulch of this tiny little styrofoam that's broken down yeah so 
those those that, photos from Memphis were that was really bad. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, there's places in the other that's really bad. You know, the, you know, a lot of bigger cities. Yeah. Up near you know Chicago on the Des Plaines near Joliet and um, the Ohio River from top to bottom is probably as as bad as any river. And I, in fact, I think it's not only like litter wise, but it's it's the most toxic river in the United States. The Ohio is another another big one, but oh. it really goes to, it, it's, it's about being pro, it, that's where the education part is like, most people can agree this trash shouldn't be there, but understanding it starts as litter. Right. Some people don't get that. And then trying to communicate, and then you guys know, but to other people, especially young kids, that, hey, this is where you get your water. And this other thing is like, we don't have an unlimited supply of water. In fact, even though most of the earth is water, less than 1% of what we actually utilize is drinking water. Yeah. You know, we're, we're lucky to live in a place that delivers water conveniently to our, our homes and we're near a big freshwater resource like, like the rivers that Illinois and Mississippi. So Mike, uh, a lot of people in uh, the Peoria area and, and even on this Zoom call have a connection to, to Caterpillar, either, you know, retiree or or employee or spouse as an employee or something like that. And um, uh, myself included. And I know that Chad came and talked at Caterpillar at least once, maybe more than that. And and uh, at one point, I think Caterpillar was a financial sponsor of they, Living they, you, Lands of they, Water. Hopefully, hopefully it still is. No, they still are. In fact, we did... One of the few cleanups we did with volunteers was with Caterpillar this year, and they've been a they've been a long time sponsor, and they even helped uh, fund the building of our our new floating classroom in 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 bars that we do the education stuff on. But yeah, they've been a long time sponsor, and 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 what's great, I, I think what's even even cooler. Obviously, it takes money to it's it's expensive to operate. You know, the operation that we have takes a lot of money to operate, but. Um, just the, the 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 volunteer, you know, when you have companies, you know, they, they say, hey, we're doing this event, you know, they're going to be there. So, you know, to get 50 people from a company to come out, that's awesome. You get you can get a lot done. Yeah, good. Any other questions? Your uh, comment just came in. It says, bravo for what you do. I admire the education part of having volunteers. So we're always Thank glad you. to have volunteers to help. That's your, that's a very really useful resource. Yes, no, it is. Thank you. Plus, it makes it fun. It's fun working with people. Yep, everybody agrees. Anybody else have any questions for Mike before he goes? So oh, I see one person just now coming in. Hi. Leap. Hi. I had one more. When you when you were showing the in your classroom, the kids or whoever was testing yeah. water. What is it that they were testing for? What kind of water test are they doing? They test for uh, phosphate levels, nitrate levels, uh, dissolved oxygen levels, uh, alkalinity levels, uh, pH levels. Um, we do turbidity test, um, oh. and it's cool that. It's it's cool the, the kids it's cool you know they're 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 being scientists and um, that that yeah that's a it, it's cool like that and we miss that you know now it's you're doing all this virtual stuff and, oh right right and that, and that, <laughs> all these activities you have their hands on and even the most powerful is going to these communities like you know kids first of all I think they when they see when they get out of the bars they say okay these guys are for real so you have their attention a little more but we'll do cleanups and then we'll do like a post, you know, discussion about what we found. And these kids are like, you can see it's clicking like, oh, wow. Because I think people know there's some of the guards, but until you get out to some of these spots and really get into it, you don't understand the magnet. Even if people that live in these communities, they, until they get out to these spots and put their hands on it, they don't understand how much is out in some of these spots. And it's mm -hmm. cool to see when you see them like, you know, clicking and kids get it. And, you know, kids just love get, doing hands on stuff. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks. No, you're welcome. Yeah. Another question just came in, Mike, is are you aware of any groups that are trying to change the use of plastics by companies? We have few options for buying products that are not packaged in plastic. 
Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not really aware, and I should be. I mean, I know a lot of there's other people out there and groups that educate people on, you know, plastic reduction. Um, and I always try to, you know, what the cool story is like we've had here, I guess in our case, we've had classes come out and they've got their schools to stop putting their lunches on styrofoam trays or using, you know, using reusable silverware instead of plastic forks. And those are always cool stories or just getting like recycling bins in their schools. Or like in East Peoria, I know we've like, given money to a teacher to put in those uh, LK drinking fountains that count like that are you can use reusable water bottles and it counts how many water bottles you save. Oh. So um, it's cool when you hear those because sometimes you don't know is it making an impact and that's really cool when you hear those stories from groups that we work with. Um, but yeah, I think I think we definitely need to and I always think of the story, you know, was it McDonald's used to well I know it was McDonald's used to have styrofoam containers for all their yeah. sandwiches. And then there was a campaign, I think, started by young kids. They got them to change that. And I think, I think we as consumers maybe need to like pressure and our, our obviously our purchasing habits get, get companies to change their behavior, but be more proactive and you know, you know, letting them know that we're concerned about this and th this is why. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. I've got one that uh, do you have a uh cookhouse uh, on your barge and uh, do your own cooking uh, for uh, as you're uh, working as crews or uh, yeah we do we we have we have a we have we have a nice kitchen with a stove refrigerator and we kind of fend for ourselves for breakfast and lunch and then usually somebody we kind of come together and eat a big dinner at, at night and kids are always fascinated they're like what, what do you guys eat out there like well we have we kind of caravan with our vehicles and like we go to the store and get regular, like they think we're just living off the land. No, we eat pretty good out there. Any other questions? Well, yeah, here's one that just came in is where is your tree nursery located? Our, our tree nursery is in Davenport, Iowa. And, uh, we had actually, we had some, we've had this year, we had, uh, you know, we didn't, we're limited working with volunteers, but we've got a guy out of East PR. He's been awesome. He's just helped out over the years. A guy by the name of Mark, um, Martin Hobbs, but he came down with his daughters and some students too, um, uh, to help us weed our nursery. So we don't have to use, you know, pesticides or anything. We just weed it by hand. Yeah. Another comment came in is that the efforts in schools are great Manufacturers are making the public responsible for the litter their products create. Thank you very much for all the you do. The magnitude of the litter problem needs to be publicized by sharing your pictures. And I think that your website is a good resource to do that. So, yeah, we all appreciate it. No, for sure. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments? Uh, before Mike uh, goes back to the uh, living lands and waters. Thank you very much. No, thank you guys. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. I, I enjoy it, and uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or uh, looking to get involved. Um, I know Dennis has my email. Dennis, feel free to share that to, with anybody. And um, you know, we we work a lot in the Peoria area too. Last year, we we did a lot of work there. Our barges were there too. And we were supposed to do more, but then everything, we're, we had these plans and these stuff with students and everything and everything kind of went to heck, so.